Good evening, Book Passage customers. We are so grateful that you are joining us this evening. We have a wonderful program ahead. My name is Cheryl Bronstein, and I am one of the event coordinators here at Book Passage. And again, very, very happy to welcome you to our conversations with authors. Um, we have a lot going on, and I'll get to that in a minute. But again, thank you. If you are new to Book Passage, welcome. If you are one of our loyal customers, well, thank you so much for supporting us. You're uh, buying your books at Book Passage and uh, tuning into our events is very helpful, and that uh, helps keep our bookstore healthy, and we can continue to offer these amazing programs. Um, for those of you who don't know, Book Passage also has a very active business-to-business -business program. And this book tonight, especially Acceptance, is a wonderful book. If you are a business or school interested in buying uh, many, many copies for either students or for your staff, this book is perfect for that. And we can offer very attractive discounts. We ship all over the country. We have amazing customer service. So if you're listening and you're interested in purchasing this book, again, for either your staff, your clients, or for a school, please call Book Passage and you can ask for, um, you say you're interested in the business to business program and we will get right on that and help you. So again, uh, keep that in mind uh, at tonight's event. So uh, we have, as I mentioned, a very busy fall and winter program. Lots of amazing events going on, both virtual and in-person. And I'm just gonna mention a few. We have a virtual event with Barbara Kingsolver who will be discussing her new fabulous novel, Demon Copperhead. And that is an online event. It takes place tomorrow, November 2nd at 1 p.m. We also have a virtual event with Steve Martin on Wednesday, November 16th at 4 p.m. Steve will be discussing his new book, Number One is Walking, My Life in the Movies and Other Diversions. Steve will touch on his legendary career, his 40 years in the movie biz, as well as a stand-up comedy, banjo playing, writing, cartooning, and many other wonderful things. Tickets to these events are still available, so please look at our calendar. It is at bookpassage.com. Just log on. You can take a look at all our, of our events. Um, we have them all listed there. We don't want you to miss any of the wonderful author events and classes that we have going on. And Book Passage uh, is a Bay Area institution. We've been around for 40 years. Quite, a, quite, quite, quite an accomplishment. We're very proud of that. It's also been a family-run business for 40 years. And that is due to our loyal customers. So thank you so much for supporting us. We hope to be around for another 40 years. Our mission at Book Passage is to enrich, engage, and inspire. We hope we can do that tonight. I read a lot of books in my role at Book Passage. And sometimes, not very often, I come across a book that grabs me so hard, I just can't stop raving about it. Enter Emmy Neatfeld's Acceptance. This is hands down one of the best books I've read in years. I loved it. I bought it for my daughters, my friends, and I've hand sold so many copies, I can't even count. This is not just my opinion. The critics are behind this book as well. A New York Times notable book, five-star book from Goodreads, a best book of August, and an editor's pick from an unnamed, very large online bookseller, a staff favorite at Book Passage, and a number one top recommended book club selection. I can go on and on. This book is simply remarkable. Acceptance is no simple story of transcendence. Instead, it complicates the narrative of pulling oneself up by the bootstraps. It is a page turning, raw and gripping memoir not to be missed. Told with a ribbon of dark humor, acceptance challenges our ideas of what it means to overcome and find contentment on your own terms. Emmy Neatfield is a writer and a software engineer. After graduating from Harvard University in 2015, she worked at Google and Facebook. Her essays have appeared in the New York Times, The Rumpus, Vice, and many other publications. She lives in New York City with her family. Our Book Passage community is so honored to have Emmy with us today. So Emmy, welcome to our Book Passage virtual stage. 
Thank you so much, Cheryl. I really am so happy to be here. Um, Book Passage is so legendary and um, I am just completely thrilled. Do you want to read um, a section of your book? Uh, I don't know if you want to set it up for our viewers. There's, there's, a, yep, there's a picture of it. First um, off, who's, who is that on the cover? Is that just a stock is, photo? This is me. Okay, that's what I thought. This is me at 15. Um, even okay. though people, some people think I look younger today. Um, but uh, yeah, it's um, from- Can you tell us about that photo? When was it taken and why'd you choose it? Um, so when I was at summer camp at Interlochen Arts Camp in Michigan, which happens in the middle of the book, um, I posed for a fellow photographer who, she was 15 years old and she took this picture. And when we were trying to come up with the cover, the team must have come up with 40 different options. Mm -hmm. And it was just a really hard book to summarize, mm -hmm. but I had sent my editor a slide deck of like pictures from high school, artwork I made. And then they finally, she was finally like, okay, this is it. We think we have it. And it was basically what I had visualized for years in my head, but I was wow. too shy to say that because it's like, who wants to say like, oh, I'd like a photograph of myself on the cover of my book. Like I'm not a celebrity, <laughs> like who cares? But it, I think it has a really nice mood that, and that kind of captures, captures the vibe. So excellent. Yeah. Um. So I'm going to read a little bit from my first day at Harvard. Okay. Chapter 20. I showed up at Harvard with two suitcases, my tie-dyed backpack from foster care, and blue hair. Campus cops directed Subarus and Porsche SUVs into makeshift parking spots. Skinny moms and sporty dads flitted in and out of doorways, carting plastic bins. No one was fat. The word Connecticut wafted through the air, a state I had never before considered, but which suddenly seemed essential. On the far edge of campus, I found the long, fluorescent-lit hallway I'd call home. After their parents cleared out, my neighbors and I gathered on the carpet between our rooms. In our class of almost 1,600, there were only 30 or so single rooms, with a few left open in case students flipped out mid-year and had to be sequestered. This gave our dorm the nickname, the Psycho Singles. <laughs> Everyone laughed. I worried I'd been quarantined. We speculated on why we'd been selected for such an honor. I think it's because we're so independent, an acapella singer volunteered, citing the high prevalence of gap years and Israeli Defense Forces service in our dorm. The others nodded as I bit my lip. To an 18 year old, independent was supposed to be a compliment. I too had longed for freedom and seen college as the path there. But now that I'd arrived, I felt acutely what I'd missed, a period where I didn't have to rely on myself. Luckily, the other girls in my pod were disarmingly nice with all the diversity of an admissions pamphlet. A Greek girl, a black girl, two Asian Americans, one girl from Hong Kong, whose parents had flown in to move her in, one girl who said she was from New Jersey, but was quickly revealed to, one girl who said she was from New York, but after questioning was quickly revealed <laughs> to be from New Jersey, and me, the girl with blue hair. In our group of nine, there were also not one, but two Manhattanites. Both of you, I asked. They sat cross-legged next to each other. Oh yeah, we know each other the blonde New Yorker said. My mouth fell into an O. What were the odds that out of nine people at Harvard, two would know each other? No one else seemed surprised. The two New Yorkers leaned against the wall at ease, as if everything in their lives had pointed towards our hallway. I looked around and wondered if anyone had a background similar to mine. If they did, they didn't let on. My richer peers, the one percenters who made up 40% of our class and the slightly less wealthy plebeians who filled it out, set the social tone. While there were folks from more modest means around somewhere, I didn't know how to find them. My boyfriend had discouraged me from joining the pre-orientation dorm crew scrubbing toilets or getting a work-study job, advising that the whole point of Harvard was cavorting with VIPs. Remembering this, I tried to wipe the shock off my face and make a good impression. 
I perked up when a girl said she was from Idaho, a state I knew solely for potatoes. What part are you from? I asked, as if coming from flyover land meant we were neighbors. She replied, oh, I went to boarding school. When asked where I was from, I took the hint and added the same caveat, pleased with myself. <laughs> well, you adapted well. <laughs> um, I guess the first, th thank you for reading that. Thank you for reading that. It really sets it up. Um, I know you, you would long so much to be there and then you get there and it's, it's really not everything that, that, that you were expecting. And we'll get into that. But, um, um, I, I have a lot of, my daughters read the book. Um, my, my friends have read the book, uh, our whole staff at the store have read the book. So I kind of pulled everybody to try and get some questions. And one of the, um, questions that came up, you know, on, a, you know, often was, did your mother read the book and, you know, what is her reaction to it? Ooh, um, so my mom has known for a long time that I was writing this book. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she's a storyteller herself. She has a very distinctive voice. And her response has always been, you know, I'm going to tell my side of the story, you know, and I'm confident that in some way, someday she'll find a way to tell, you know, her side of the story. Um, I can't presume to speak for how she feels about it, mm -hmm. um, but I hope that she feels like it's fair and that she's represented as a complicated in many ways, very lovable person, which she is, you know, with a big, with a big heart in many, many ways. Has it, uh, has your, has the book, uh, changed the relationship with you and your mom? I mean, I know it's always been very complicated. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's really hard to explain. It's hard to describe, yeah. um, but has it, has it changed it in any, in a good way or, or, or a bad way? I would say it changed my relationship with my mom. Where, you know, for years I felt like I was, I could only tell a version of my story that she would agree with. Mm -hmm. And then writing something like this, you know, taking a reader through my eyes for 380 pages, there was, there became no way to do that. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you are sitting firmly in like my seat and like, you see my younger self, like make these accommodations for my mom, but it really had to be from, from my point of view. Mm -hmm. um, I will say it it really improved relationships with other family members in a way that I did not expect or anticipate. Like I thought people would never want to speak to me again. Mm -hmm. um, and then my my nephews read the book. Um, one is twenty one, and the other is he. I got gave it to him for his seventeenth birthday. Okay. Mm -hmm. I it was censored. I put in some like post it notes to censor it, and then he's like, I believe I am mature enough to read it mm -hmm. without the post its, yeah. and so he did. And um, and it it definitely helped me get closer to to certain family members who I had felt really isolated from. Okay, that well, that's nice to hear. So some good, yeah. so uh, some. It's it's not. I, I'm glad to hear that it drew out some family members that maybe you didn't have a real close relationship with, and now you have an opportunity to develop that. Yeah, that's what um, I and uh, as we go along. Um, I have three daughters. They, uh, my, my oldest, they go from 25 to 30. And I have to say, I mean, the book, I, the book was hard to read as a parent, but one of the hardest parts for me was, um, when you talk about your boyfriend, when you were in college, having that boyfriend, uh, which obviously was not a healthy relationship. And, you know, I, I you, you, you set yourself up, you know, you did not have a lot of choices. Um, and, you kind of relied on him for basic things like housing and food and things like that. But looking back now, what, what are your thoughts on that, on that relationship? Oh, yeah. I talked to a lot of girlfriends who also dated older guys, especially when they were 18, 19 years old. And I often feel like we dated the exact same guy. Mm -hmm. I read a friend's book and I, I had to text her and be like, what's his real name? Cause I was like, I think that these, wow. I think these two men we dated are exactly the same. Yeah. And I think it, you know, it's one of those things where when you're 18 or 19, it's kind of impossible to imagine how, what it's like to be a 27 year old as my ex-boyfriend was when I met him, you know, and you just think, okay, this person's older than me, but, um, 
But I've had to kind of go through those stages of being 27 myself and being like, I would never date an 18 year old and being 28 and be like, I wouldn't date a 19 year old either. Um, and so I think it's really a shame how, how people like him can take advantage of, yeah. of like vulnerable girls. And, and I also, you know, it was really hard. It was hard to write about in part mm-hmm. because like, you know, I went through all this stuff, got my dream of going to Harvard mm-hmm. and then it was not perfect. Like, and in part because of him. Um, but I do think it's important to, to write about and talk about so that other young women and moms and, you know, people can, can be aware of these warning signs and like, you know, it's just a playbook for how these guys operate. So I hope that that helps somebody else avoid it. Oh, I'm sure it will. I mean, again, I I think one of the reasons why I thought it was really hard to read was obviously because you were so close to becoming independent, you know, there you were at Harvard. Um, but yet you were still, you know, in a relationship that wasn't healthy for you. And so, you know, you were so close, you were so close, but not there yet. And, yeah. and that, that, that made it, you know, I was rooting for you and that, that, that made it difficult, but I agree. I think, um, I think it is so important to, to, you know, put things like that in the book because, and I'm sure, I'm sure you've, um, you know, talked to a lot of other young women now who, you know, they'll read that and maybe see themselves in, in, you know, in that, in, in, in those, those storylines. And maybe do something about it. Yeah, hopefully. I hope so. So thank you. I'm sure that was hard to write. Um, so you work uh you, you work full time. Uh you always you've always worked. I mean, obviously from your book. I mean, you started working as soon as you could. So you were always you've always been working your whole life. How did you have time to write a book, you know, write your memoir? Yeah. Oh, you know, I actually I went, I was at Google. Like normal work day, it was like November 1st, almost exactly seven years ago, November mm. 1st, 2015. And I went to like a personal development workshop at the office that was about goal setting. And I made a list of goals and I was like, I'm going to learn Chinese and I'm going to write a book. <laughs> and I signed up for Chinese lessons that night, did it for a year and a half. And I also started writing acceptance that night. Wow. Um, and in the book, I, I write about how as a teenager, I did National Novel Writing Month. NaNoWriMo, where you do 50,000 words in a month of November. And that was how I wrote the first draft. I would go to come home from work. And because I practiced writing garbage as a teenager, I could write for, you know, I could do 1600 words in 45 minutes. And I just lied to myself over and over again. I said, you know, it'll only take this one month that I'll have a publishable book. And then it only takes six months for the second draft. And then, um, after five years of really escalating lies, I finally sold it. Um, and I did have, I was lucky enough to have some time off um, in between jobs and then um, in the process of actually like publishing it. Um, but it it was really with that, with that initial, like, I'm going to write absolute trash. And that's what the first draft was. <laughs> Well, lucky for us, um, the book the book is just phenomenal. So, uh, you know, thank you for continuing to write it. Was it hard? I mean, here you are. You're a young person. Um, you don't have experience in publishing. Was it hard to find an agent and to get the book published? And you know, I'm sure there are people out here listening who are you know working on their memoir. How you know how many drafts did you send in? And you know, what was the rejection process like for you? I was completely an outsider to the writing world, Um, had a little experience in high school, but that's obviously very different. And so I started querying the book about two years in, Mm -hmm. um, and, and I probably got a hundred rejections. Wow. Yeah. And I wish I had kept a spreadsheet or something, but, um, but in my one of my very first rounds of sending it out, I sent it to this agency that um, the somebody actually replied. She asked for the whole manuscript. She read it. She was like, I love this, but we don't represent memoirs that aren't researched. We only do research memoirs. So would you consider adding research? Okay. And I was like, yeah, sure. I'll do anything to get this published. <laughs> um, but it, it didn't it didn't work out super well the re- when I tried that time. Um, but I did send it back to the agency. And by then, my the agent who liked it had moved on to Penguin. Okay. And 
so she was like, let's get coffee. Um, we, you know, she, she was like, this is what I need from you. And she followed up with me for like two years after that. Um, and then she finally became my editor. We sold the book to her. That's and great. It was, and it was her first book too. Um, and okay. so like, I have such a debt of like, we really, I feel like we really learned so much together. Yeah. And you could not have asked for a better editor. Yeah. And I wonder, I mean, you, you're, I mean, you're so resilient, a hundred, a hundred rejections to, you know, many people would kind of may say I, I'm done, but um, not you. And that's part of your strength. And, you know, and we see that in the book. Oh, thank you. I mean, I feel like I learned so much from the various rejections. And if I had been able to publish this book six years ago, like I would have loved to, it would have been completely different. Mm. And back then I was trying, trying to tell this straightforward story of like, I got into Harvard, I'm a great person, combined with this sense of like, I did bad things, let me confess. And it, it really did take that time to do that research, to get feedback from so many different people. Um, so I'm really glad, <laughs> I'm really glad that it actually, in hindsight, that it took so long. And what was the hardest part for you to write? Like, was there, uh, you know. I feel like I spent five years writing the first 350 pages and then. Okay. Like, no, let me redo that. Like four years writing the first, like 90% of the book. And then like four years working on just the epilogue. Oh. My math might not add up, so don't <laughs> check me on that. But yeah, but because when I was a teenager and I was, you know, in the mental health system, I was being medicated, I was in foster care, I did not have a sense of context. It was just me moving through the world. And I was treated as if I was the only person who had faced these issues or, you know, and that everything that was happening was because of something about me right? Like that I was bad or a failure. And so it was really hard as an adult to go back and basically build that context for myself. And it involved doing so much research, interviewing people, learning about all these different systems. And then, um, you know, I made the conscious decision that most of the book reads like a novel mm -hmm. where the, the reader does not get information usually that I did not have. Okay. And yeah. And yeah. And you might not notice that going through it. Right. Because I do try to have a sense of perspective, but all of that, all of that stuff got put into the epilogue. So that was like okay. a feat to try to put it all into like 30 pages. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it's a, you know, the book is raw. It, it's very emotional. Um, and I'm sure there were parts that were painful for you to write, at least to rem you know, remember and um, reconstruct. Is there anything that you edited out of the book that you want to share with us? Oh, man. You know, there were so many things that I edited out um, and that felt like I was tearing out my heart, but I, I don't remember most of them. Oh. Um, yeah, I think that the main thing that that was one of the last things to go was I had this, this older student when I was applying to college, she had like won all the awards. She'd gotten into scholastic. She's this like beautiful goddess. Um, and I had spent a few days with her where she, you know, kind of gave me, I wanted college advice from her mm -hmm. and she was just like, be yourself and was super cagey about it. Mm -hmm. And it really like, I don't know. I, I thought about it like every day for years. And then when you sit down to write it, you're like, okay, but what's the point, <laughs> you know? So. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, I guess you, you, you really wanted something more concrete from her and she, she didn't deliver. Yeah. <laughs> Frustrating. I yeah. And she's, she's a venture capitalist in the Silicon Valley now. So she's, <laughs> she's, she's a star and a goddess. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're a New York times bestselling author, so you're not doing so bad yourself. <laughs> Um, one thing that you mentioned in your book towards the end, which I thought was really insightful is that you talk about, um, kind of how society's views on certain things have changed since you were small, like, you know, there's more awareness about mental illness and hoarding and sexual abuse. And, um, where do you see, we need to focus more, where does more awareness need to be as we, you know, move into this decade? 
That's a great question. Um, you know, I, I would say in light of a lot of the political stuff that's happening right now, that just maintaining the forward progress that we have made is going to be a battle. And, you know, there's a pendulum of history and we had a lot more acceptance. Mm -hmm. And then even since I, the book went to the press, you know, there were, like, I was writing it and it was like trans, tra like acceptance of trans people had become so much more prevalent, right? Mm -hmm. And my parents is trans. And then as I was writing it, it was like every day there was a new bill that was coming out targeting trans people. Um, and so I think that being aware of how those specific policy policies impact individuals and individuals who are really trying to get the American dream, who are trying to work hard and have a better life for themselves, to kind of keep that empathy in mind. That's what I hope that reading reading personal stories can can do for people, um, because it's it's hard to hold on to empathy. It's easy to be angry. It's easy to be filled with hate. It's easy to say things have to change. And it's a lot harder to like step inside of somebody else's shoes. Agreed. Yeah. Um, well, moving on, no one can no one can deny your drive and focus. And, you know, one thing that we, you know, obviously see in the book is your um, you know, constantly uh studying and drilling yourself on those uh library SAT books. And I'm just wondering if you still have that same level of drive and focus today as an adult. You know, I'm working on pulling it back. <laughs> I feel like every therapy session is like, how do I learn how to like focus on the process? Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's an irony because I don't think I would have been able to write the book if I hadn't still had that, those vestiges of, you know, I have to do this thing or I'm going to explode. Um, and I think that's probably common to a lot of authors, right? Where you're like, there's no, it has to, it has to happen. Um, but I definitely have been trying to, it's a privilege to be able to say, you know, what, what do I enjoy doing and how can I do more of that? I feel really, really lucky to be in that position, um, because not many people get to be in that place, um. But well, I mean, are you when at work, are you like really driven at work? Are you, um, you know, and or yeah. uh, is there a hobby that you're really passionate about right yeah. now? Well, I I actually, I, I quit my day job. Okay. Um, a little while ago. And so I've been writing full time. Excellent. And, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it's been really, and I'm working on this piece that it's going to come out in a little, in a month or so. And it's about mental health in college applications. <sighs> And so, so it, needed. And it's my first like deeply reported piece. And so like a week and a half ago, I was doing these interviews and I was like losing my voice. I was just wanted to talk to everyone for like two and a half hours. Like my editor was like, talk to three students and I talked to 11. <laughs> um, and so it's just like, I, but I mean, I would love if that's my next chapter is doing reporting and journalism for stories that like, that I feel really need to be told. Good for you. Your voice is definitely needed in that arena. I'm, I'm, the, I'm, I'm really happy to hear that you're, that's where your focus is right now because that we, we definitely need to hear your voice there. Um, and kind of moving, kind of in the same vein, um, you, you know, as a child and a young person, um, you're still young, but um, you had a lot of stress in your life, a lot of stress. Um, today, how do you manage stress? I, I love working out. Mm -hmm. uh, I have definitely gone overboard on it, but I'm think it's a healthier relationship now. Um, I, I also take a lot of pride in my home. Um, and so while I was in the process of writing this book, my husband, Byron and I from, he's in the book too. We yes. bought our first apartment. Um, we bought an apartment, we renovated, we moved in. And for me, just it feels so special for it to be like our, you know, our home, really mm -hmm. like our home and our family. And so, um, yeah, when I, when I need to decompress, I will go on Etsy and I'll spend an hour okay. just like looking at rugs, tagging all the rugs. Okay. Um, 
but it, you know, it just makes me feel really grounded and relaxed and at peace to just, you know. Well, th- we can see why. I mean, you <laughs> didn't really have a home. I mean, you moved around all the time and now you have your home. So congratulations. Thank you. Um, that is a milestone for you. And um, I'm sure it feels really good. Uh, that's that's wonderful to hear. And you are creative. I mean, you you're, you know you're a photographer, so visually, I'm sure you like to make your home you know beautiful. And what have you bought? What have you bought? Sh- share share with us some of your home home decorating things that you bought. We want to live vicariously through all your uh, your beautiful designs. Well, you can see behind me a beautiful brick wall, um, which I didn't <laughs> buy. It came with the apartment. Um, but Byron and I had our biggest fights ever over our sofa. Mm. And we had a very strict list of what we wanted our sofa to be. And it turns out he is very picky. Like he has a, he actually has a great design sense despite (laughs) being a fellow software engineer. And, um, and I really wanted a white sofa and he was like, I'm going to have to clean it. Like he knew he was going to be on the hook with like the rag and like the, so we ended (laughs) up getting a remover. Yeah, exactly. We ended up getting a slip covered sofa from a brand called made in home. That's Mm -hmm. like direct to consumer. And it's, it's huge. It's like 10 foot by eight foot. Wow. Okay. It's it's the most comfortable sofa in the world. Like, I think we'll have the sofa for the rest of our lives. (laughs) Well, that that's lovely and and good. I'm glad it's a big sofa. You can invite people to stay over and sleep on it. And uh, yeah. Well, that's good. And that's your real anchor that, you know, that anchors the room. So that's great. Um, We know Harvard is a very small and tight knit community. And um, I'm curious about what were some of your classmates reactions when you wrote this book? Because I'm sure you've heard a lot of things like what, what were, what did you hear? What were some of the things you heard from your classmates? Oh man. Um, I, I got a lot of love from the computer science department, Mm -hmm. which was great. Um, And I heard a lot of people telling me that, that they, um, you know, that they had similar experiences in some ways, Mm -hmm. but that they did not feel comfortable talking about it. And that even just being like working class to like, you know, middle, what I consider really, really middle class, Mm -hmm. That, that, that there was a lot of shame associated with that on campus. Um, and it it was such a wild experience to go through the four years of college in many ways feeling really alone and then to graduate and be getting drinks with friends and then have them say, you know, yeah, my parents were hoarders. Like I'm on the hook mm. for my family financially. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of mental health issues in this unit that was really, it was really wild. And I wish that I had known at the time that there was this kind of, that there's the the persona people present yeah. and that you go to Harvard to learn yeah. how to present that persona. But then there's really the truth underneath it. Right. So it seems like there's more, maybe a, I mean, there's definitely an element of shame because here you are at like, you know, the top, one of the top universities in the whole world. And, uh, you know, everything should be great. And, and it isn't always great. Yeah, definitely. definitely. I mean, that, that was one thing that, you know, and I've, I'm sure the readers all, all, you know, sense that too. And you, you were, you did a really good job about um, kind of explaining that because, you know, this was your dream for so long and then you got there and, you know, li- life, life didn't turn into like chocolate and roses. You know, you still, there were still a lot of issues Yeah, that you had definitely. to face. Yeah. And I think some of it is inevitable. And then some of it, you know, there's ways that Harvard University and other elite universities really can do better in supporting students who are from these, you know, non-traditional backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah, well, that's important. And hopefully, you know, you're you're talking to your uh, high school kids now. So I'm sure that uh, that'll be something that, you know, you can discuss with them. It seems like um, in this country, you know, there's just a, such a uh, drive and such so much pressure on these kids to get into college. Um, and of course, you know, you know, you've got parents, you know, really, you know, t- trying to, you know, funnel their kids into elite colleges, which might, might all, not always be the best fit. Um, and I'm just curious, like, um, you know, wh- what do you think about that? And um, how, how is it, how can we maybe as parents, um, you know, take a step back and just really try and find the right fit for our kid? 
when I was in high school, it was really eye-opening to me when I had a roommate at boarding school who I called Jane, who went to Palo Alto High School, mm -hmm. which will be familiar to many of your readers. And, you know, I had gone to schools that were really under-resourced, where the expectations were not high, and I suffered because of it. And it was mind-blowing to meet somebody who had basically the opposite experience where there was so much pressure such high expectations that it was leading kids to want to harm themselves mm -hmm. and I really struggled with like how do you reconcile these two things and for me it I I put it together as two sides of the same coin for inequality and living in a society where you know parents are so afraid that their kids are going to have a good life. Mm -hmm. And I have nephews and who are, you know, they're getting older. And my wish for them is that they can become a teacher. They can be a retail worker if they want an easy, you know, a job that lets them do music and make art. Basically that they can have a normal job and that they can be okay. You know, that yeah. they don't have to be rich, but, and I think that that, that type of life is just increasingly elusive and and like even wealthy people are terrified of what is going to happen to my kids so I think that that is that that's really driving it and you know there's ways to support kids emotionally but I also think it's important to recognize that kind of undercurrent of how you know the ec economy that we live in it it's making a lot of people really sick agreed Agreed. Well, I think your voice is going to um, be very important in this arena. So thank you for pursuing your energy that way. Um, you're a beautiful writer and you're very skilled at conveying emotion. Um, when, if you remember, when was the first time or the first experience you had where you learned that language has power? Mm. Maybe in the Bible, okay. in Bible class, mm -hmm. in the beginning, there was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I had that as my email signature for a while, even when I was, after I became agnostic. <laughs> um, but like, I, I grew up in this world where we were really organizing ourselves around this book and around the literal words, you know, that people wrote a ton of years ago yeah. and translated. That's interesting. That's, that's an interesting answer. I didn't expect you to say that, but thank you. That's, that's, that's very interesting. Um, do you read your own uh, reviews? You're, you're the book critics. Do you, do you read, do you read what, do you read your reviews? Good. And what, how do you deal with a good or bad review? I, I've read the professional critics. I've read everything. And then for Goodreads, I read them until I got one that I didn't like, and then I blocked it. <laughs> um, but I do, um, you know, I think for me, when I, often when I read negative reviews, my problem is that I identify with it too much. And okay. I think, you know, like somebody said, you know, the end of this book is really long. And I was like, and I was like, I agree. I was like, I wish it were shorter. Right. And, <laughs> <laughs> and so then, I, but I had to be like, it's, it's in print, it's happening. Um, but for me, it was, it was really, really helpful to have the experience querying agents and when, you know, sometimes you just get a form back or you get silence. And then other times people would write to me stuff that would be like really hurt my feelings, right? Mm -hmm. Like one per, for an earlier draft, one agent was like, you know, I wanted to like you, but I couldn't. Aww. And I wanted to cheer for you and I just couldn't do it. And then, you know, I, I think it's because she went to Yale and she's bitter, but, but that's only in hindsight, right? But, but then it was, it, it's useful to, to be, to look back and be like, okay, where, where is this coming from? Right. Mm -hmm. And it's clearly true for that person. And to, for me, like, I do have that attitude of like feedback is a gift and some of it wow. is just, well, we, I mean, I went to the high school where we workshopped each other every day, like, and after you've been workshopped for a full hour, by a room full of high schoolers, <laughs> like nothing I've heard since, like even compares to like the vitriol of high school workshops. So, <laughs> wow, 
Okay. So, so if you want to be a writer, that's probably a good thing to do just, you know, to continue to, you know, workshop uh, and, and listen to that feedback. Yeah. I mean, and some of it, and some of it is not helpful. And then that's really where I have like tried to block it out Mm -hmm. of like, yeah. Does your, is your husband like supportive? Does he say, you know, Emmy, don't listen to that. Or, you know, or, or, you know, does he help you put things in perspective? Yeah, he does. He, he's read the book probably 40 times. Wow. Okay. And he's like, when are you going to write another book? Like I need something to read. And we would just like, (laughs) we would just be reading together. And then he would just read acceptance over and over again. And so I really think he's earned the title of my biggest fan. Okay. Well, I hope so. I hope so. Um, so when you write a book and it gets published and people read it, uh, it often brings, you know, you've got long lost friends and family that kind of like creep out of the woodwork. You mentioned your nephews that um, you uh, have reconnected with. Any other like friends or, you know, people from your past that you've been surprised about that have come up and embraced you? There were a lot of family members from my dad's side of the family mm-hmm. who I had never met because of estrangement who reached out to me via my website and they were like, Hey, I'm from the small town in Minnesota. Like you have, you know, the 72 aunts and uncles. And that was really, it was really fascinating. Like next time I go to Minnesota, I'm going to have to do a detour to go visit all my like long yes. last year. Yeah. Well, that's nice. Cause you know, you, you didn't have, you didn't have a family. You didn't have that st- support or, you know, extended family growing up. So yeah. do you feel that, uh, do you feel now it's developing or, or not yet? Do you think uh, there is there potential? I think there's potential there. Yeah, I'm definitely open to it. And I think that there's there's also this element of family history, right? Where when there is like, you know, estrangement can be really healthy for everyone involved. And also it can lead to losing a lot of just information, right? Like yeah. I, my grandmother appears in the book, but there were so many things that I did not know about her life until very, very recently that people have been sharing with me. Um, And that it's, it feels really meaningful to know, like, this is who I descended from, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm glad you're getting that now because you didn't have that earlier growing up. And I I do think, I do think that is important and it gives you confidence. And I'm glad, I'm glad to hear that you, you have your, you have that now. Um, What about your relationship with your mentor? I think her name was Annette. Are you still in touch with her? Yeah. Yeah. She's, she's still so important to me. Um, and I think it was, you know, it was a little bit difficult for her, the process of me publishing this book, um, because when she read an earlier draft, it was, it was darker, believe Mm -hmm. it or not, it was Mm -hmm. a darker version of the book. And I think it was really, really hard to be in this position where she did absolutely everything she could have done for me. And my life was still really difficult. Yeah. But I mean, you, you're definitely grateful to her. I mean, there's appreciation there that, that I, I think that you don't, a lot of young people don't always express, but we certainly saw that from you with her. Um, and kind of taking the next step, um, are you interested at all in mentoring uh, any foster kids And this, you know, are you doing it or is that, are you thinking about it? Yeah, right now I'm right now I'm mentoring a young writer um, through Girls Right Now in New York City. Her okay. college applications are due today, so that's fun. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm definitely interested in becoming, especially court appointed special advocate. Yeah, CASA, right? Yeah, yeah. So basically, guardian ad litems for foster youth, and a lot of people don't know this, but when when a foster child's case is coming to court. The CASA is the only person who is really advocating for the child's interest. Like the social workers are usually very focused on reunification. There's like a lawyer for the parent, but um, I would, you know, I think it's a huge responsibility and something that I don't take lightly, but that is a way that I would really love to give back. I agree. I think you'd be so valuable doing that. Um, you know, just because of your experience and, and also because of your, uh, you know, your calmness and, uh, your, you can think really clearly. I hope you can do that. I hope you pursue that. Um, and you also, in the book, you talked, um, there was a little mention about, like, we talk about our family reunification. Um, like, I think there was one point where you wanted to go into, you were, you need, had no place to go. You wanted to go to a shelter, but the shelter wasn't going to take you. 
uh, if you, uh, if there was a chance you're going to, uh, you know, reunite with your mom, what do you think about those situations? And, um, I don't know, would you, would you want to change anything now that you've got, now that you're an adult looking back? Yeah, I, so that situation, when I, I went to the shelter and they told me, you know, you can only stay here if you're willing to mm -hmm. unite with your mom, mm -hmm. go home with your mom. And, and it was something that I knew really was not going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and it put me in a really difficult position to figure out what, you know, what do I say? And I said, you know, sure, fine, I will do it. Um, but I, I, yeah, I think it's just, I don't know. I just wish that I, I wish I had had a guide to the system, you know, and known like, this is how things work because you don't, because like the reality is a lot of children go into foster care, they are reunited with their families and then they have the issues were not resolved mm -hmm. and they don't have anywhere to go. And that was actually what I learned when I went to this shelter, because there were so many other people who were in that situation. Mm -hmm. And in a way it was just such a gift to be in that space with those people and realize like, Oh, maybe this isn't all about me. Maybe this mm -hmm. is a wider problem. Mm -hmm. Do you have any like recurring nightmares or, you know, stress about, uh, is there a specific, uh, and, uh, thing that ha that you that you you know dream about or stress nightmare about I have I have a lot of dreams about being in residential treatment okay which is when I was in the, this yep. locked facility for yep. teenagers yeah okay. and just dreams about being like captured like brought back there like institutionalized mm -hmm. against my will um yeah that's the that's the main it's the main recurring nightmare. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, oh. it's okay. I, it was. It's fascinating to to once again to talk to other people who are in that position. Yeah, and realize like, oh, this is some of the things that are happening for me. They're happening for a lot of other people. Yeah. Well, you're able to really write about it again. You know, it's very. Uh, it's hard to read, but um, I'm glad that um, you put the story out there for those of us who don't really know, you know, haven't experienced it or don't know someone who has. So you know, education is always so important. Um, I'm switching gears here a little bit, but um, you worked for Disney one summer and um, I have two daughters that actually work for Disney and corporate. And I'm just curious about what, what did you do for them and what, you know, what was your experience like? And uh, did you ever want to work for them again? Or did, you know, I know you work for Google, but like, what was, what was your experience that summer? Yeah. I was a gap year intern in Imagineering. Okay. And I basically did someone's expense reports. I made faxes, PowerPoints, et cetera. Um, and it was a it was a fascinating place to be. Um, it that was one of the big things that made me want to study computer science because we had another we had a computer science intern who was making twice as much money as I uh -huh. made. Okay. Like he made twenty he made twenty one dollars an hour. <laughs> And I was like, if I made $21 an hour, I would be so rich. <laughs> so I was like, I'm going to study computer science so that I can make $21 an hour when I grow up. That's great. Yeah. Um, okay. So you, so just to, uh, oh, one more question before we, we get you, we bring you up to the current. Um, do you ever Google yourself? Have you ever done that? And like, what, what do you, what do you think about it? Um, oh man, I have an alert set up. Well, Byron has an alert set up to notify about new stuff. Um, it was pretty, it was pretty interesting to see my search results. Like after I got married, we had a New York times wedding announcement, which was something I really wanted as like a status symbol and now it seems extremely dumb, but, um, but it was really funny how it was like, Oh, that was the top search result for me for a while. Oh. And I feel like that's, you know, it says something, it says something about society, right? That's surprising. Yeah. 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 Um, so I'm very relieved that that's like on the second or third page now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so bring us up to date, Emmy. Tell us, uh, give us a window into your life now. You said you quit your day job. Um, it, it was it you were at Google, right? That was your last employer. Or, okay. I was at Google and then I was at Facebook. Okay. Okay. So Facebook. Okay. Yeah. All right. So now you're writing and um, 
you know, tell us, tell us how, how, what your, what your life is like now. Yeah, I am working on doing reporting and reported pieces on like mental health, teenagers, um, other health topics. And, um, I have been doing a lot of like promo for acceptance. So mm-hmm. I feel like there's so many things that are happening in the world that are very tied up with this book, like the affirmative action Supreme Court case that's going on Mm -hmm. and all these questions around like who deserves an elite education, what should colleges focus on when they're admitting people. Um, And so it's been, it's been really fun to feel like, to feel like, you know, I have this book and now I have a whole new career as a writer in all these different, different new ways. Well, that's great. Um, we're excited for you. Um, I, I'm in, so glad to hear you about your uh, reporting. And um, again, that is an arena that I think you can really, really impact young people. And I know that you will. Um, so I wish you a lot of luck in that. Is there anything else you want to uh, talk about before we sign off? Is there, uh, you know, do you want to give shout outs or anything like that before we we head out? Um. Shout out to my editor, who's the best editor in the world, Mia <laughs> Council, um, at Penguin Press. Um, and yeah, I'm just so I've been so grateful and blown away by independent bookseller support. I just truly love indie bookstores, and just ever since I was a kid, and I was like afraid to go in them, and I would just like stand outside mm-hmm. and like look in the window. Um, <laughs> it means it means the world to to have you. Um, like supporting acceptance. I almost cried in your intro. So I was so touched. Well, again, I, we are a hundred percent supportive behind this book. It is an important book. It's, it's a kind of book that, um, you know, a young person reads and it'll really change their life for the better. And those are the types of books that I love selling. So um, if you haven't read this book, again, it's called acceptance. I would normally be holding up a copy of the book, but I've given all my copies away to other people. So um, hold up a copy. There we go, Emmy. There we go. There's the cover. Um, It's for sale at Book Passage. And I highly recommend uh, this book for you. Um, If you're a book group person out there, you need a book for your next book group pick. This is it. Book Passage has this as their number one book club selection. So yeah, so this is great. And again, schools, um, I'd love to get this book into the uh, high high schools across the country. Um, I think it would be very impactful. So um, I'm going to be working on that on my end. But if I've got any teachers out there, please call Book Passage. We would love to get this book into your schools. And um, Emmy, thank you so much for spending uh, an hour with us today. Um, again, we we are so gracious, uh, so grateful. You are so gracious. And we are so grateful to have you on our virtual stage. Next time you're in the Bay Area, please come by and say hello to us, uh, our staff there. And I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight, for tuning in. Again, this this event will be archived. So um, you've got folks and friends out there who have not had a chance to view it actually tonight. It will be on our website in a couple of days. We will put it up there. Please encourage people to watch. Again, the book is Acceptance. Good night. Thank you very much, Emmy. We wish you all the best. Good luck. Thank you so much for having me.